What's going on, everyone? Today I'm joined by D. Michelle Thompson, author of the book Table for One. So, D. Michelle, how you doing? I'm doing wonderful. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, now, let me ask you a question. Your book Table for One, what inspired that book? What inspired me to write the book was really a close friend of mine died while she was in the middle of a divorce. And a pastor came to the hospital with us and the doctors had said, you're dying because water has built up around your heart and it's choking your heart and you can die if you don't have the surgery. And the pastor shared with her, you know, I hear what the doctor says, but let me tell you what the Lord says. You're not dying because water built up around your heart. You're dying because of a broken heart. And when I heard those words, I really thought about what I had been going through as a single, trying to decide whether or not to get married, because everybody was saying in your late 20s, it's time to get married, and all this pressure that you have around. I realized there were more people than myself going through this, feeling like we had to make something work, a marriage or uh, a relationship out of the will of God, just so you could say you're married and whole. And after she died, I really felt inspired that I needed to go and write this book and this message that you can be whole and complete in Christ and lack no good thing. No, I, I I definitely agree with that. Um, but let's let's talk about you know people who are single. You know, let's say men versus women. Um, one thing I do know that a person, no matter who they are, no matter how great they are, cannot make you whole. No, no human being can because see, if you have that mindset, mm -hmm. um, they're gonna do something. Possibly, they're gonna be human. Yeah, and they're gonna fail you. Exactly. And then if they fail you, now your wholeness is gone. So let me ask you a question in your, in your book. Are you referenced to people about being whole in Christ way before they even think about a relationship? Exactly. Um, too often people find out once they're in something that they're not whole and, oh, I need to back up even after they've already said I do. But my book is set up to um, really share the principles um, from a faith-based perspective mm -hmm. of how you can be whole and complete before you even go in. And what I always say is God ordains two whole singles to come together, not two halves. Yeah, and what you know what I tell people is this when it comes to relationships. Um, the two main things I wanted to cover this, and you know, you can correct me on this. Um, people come into relationships with selfish reasons. Yeah. Even when you say about somebody making you whole, that's a selfish reason. Mm -hmm. That's not has nothing to do with um, serving someone else, or what can I do to make their life better? Kind of like you know, what Christ wanted to serve the people, um, to be the greatest servant of all. So, do you tell single people that instead of going to a relationship with a selfish reason, like what I can get, what this man could do for me, what he can possibly put me at? Do I mean, do you cover about what you can offer that person? Absolutely. I talk about how first you got to know your purpose, who you are and what you were created to be and know that that person is a compliment or you're a help to them, not so much of what they can give you, but who are you and identifying yourself in Christ at first. That's why I always call the table for one. Set the table for one, know your purpose. Then I talk about, you know, everybody's going to have baggage that they bring to the table. So I talk about things you need to cut out and make sure you've been healed and whole because a lot of people go into a relationship thinking that next person is going to treat them the way the last person did, or they have all these, boundaries set up because the last time I did that, this happened. And so I'm like, you know, you have to ask God to heal you from all of that and come to the table whole and ready with something to offer. I always say an open hand is ready to give and receive. But when you come close, like I just need somebody to cover me. That's what women always do. They, they pull out the scripture. I need a covering. I need this and that. But what are you ready to give? So absolutely. Now you're saying about the baggage and you just referred to insecurity or using uh, past relationships to create boundaries, which there's nothing wrong with learning from the past and say, okay, I don't want this repeat um, negativity to happen. So I want to make sure I guard from that. But outside from that, what other baggage that you see people bring into relationships? Well, I believe, I don't want to say, I, I use, I don't want to, term people as baggage. But no, 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 no. I understand. What mo when you use the word baggage, is you bringing things into the relationship that had nothing to do with the relationship from the past. That's the baggage. Exactly. So emotional hurts, emer emotional wounds, abuse, whatever. And a lot of times there's different baggage around other relationships. They're still friends with the ex or they still have different, I call them soul ties. And I believe you're familiar with that. A lot of people have soul ties, emotional ties to the other person. I have one guy tell me it, he's still paying the bills of another woman and he's still pursuing a new relationship. And I'm going, 
how's that going to work? And uh, <laughs> exactly. So there's all different things that people bring to the table and they have to really get healed and whole over that before they can pursue a new relationship. Yeah, no, you just talking about, you know, you, I, I've heard the, the, the term soul ties before, but I can tell you right now that let me, let me say it another way. Um, if you just cut their stuff off, mm -hmm. stop sleeping with a person. I don't know why you're taking care of a woman that you're not with. I don't understand that one. So any woman you get with, you know, and you have some men that do that. Like, well, you know, uh, I was talking to a guy that he has a new woman and he told me that he pays the phone bill of his child's mother. And I said, why? I say, isn't she capable? Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, but my other lady was upset about it. I say, yeah, would you think? I mean, so, you know, some people do silly things like that and think it's okay. And if you go do silly things like that, you should just be single till your kids grow up or whatever. Yeah, or get married to the other person. You know, I tell men, like, well, if you're doing that much, there's obviously a pool there that maybe you should be her husband or whatever. Mm -hmm. I had a guy date me. He was used to dating women with kids. Mm -hmm. And so he was still being there for the other woman's kids and all this. I'm like, well, if you're pursuing me, you can't pursue me and still be a father to these, you know, and they're like, oh, that's me. You're selfish. You're this, you're that. I know what I want. I want to create a whole unit with me and my family. So I'm not going to have you still in the past. So let's break. Cease and desist. Yes. You, you had every right to tell him that, um, you know, it's just like uh, any women that want to keep, you know, having uh, conversations or even like say the child's father or whatever, you know, you have some of those situations where, you know, this guy has all kind of access outside of the children to the woman and the guy say, so it's my child's father or whatever. Like, well, you know, you like you said, well, you should probably go marry the guy. I'll go be with the guy. If you still want to do that. Um, you know, some people don't realize they think you're being mean when you say that. But when you're in a relationship with somebody, it's you and them, not you, them, and, and this other female or this other man. Right. I call it um, step two at the table, cut the substitutes and wait on God. Um, a lot of times we have these different substitutes built up because we don't feel whole. We don't feel complete. So in some way, shape, or form, this little relationship here, this little relationship there is making us feel whole without getting that from God first. Now you you mentioned something you said waiting on God and I, and I and I hear people say that a lot waiting on God um, but what does it mean to you to wait on God? For me, it's really had to, I've had to renew my mind in this area because I am forty three, single yet to be married or have children and so a lot of people look at me like what are you waiting on? <laughs> mm -hmm. And I believe that it I had to really understand who I am in him and what my purpose is. So my weight has been really more about experiencing more of God and really allowing him to fulfill me in every way and fill, allowing him to fill up my plate. A lot of times we try to fill up our plate of life to try and look like the Joneses or whoever else. But for me, waiting on God has really become a part of a journey of really understanding who I was created to be and enjoying every moment of life, knowing that what he has for me is for me, and it may not look like everybody else. So the way has become, you know, let patience have its perfect work <laughs> and really understanding the fullness of joy that I have in God. Now, you know, for me, I, I've heard that term a lot, waiting on God. But what I've learned in my lifetime is that a lot of times God is waiting on you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and once I've learned that principle that he's waiting on you, maybe certain decisions you need to make. Maybe certain moves you need to, you know, be doing. Maybe certain things in your heart is not right. Maybe certain attitudes isn't right that need to change to get you to the point where you need to be. And I'm going to lead that into this. Um, what does the scripture teach about relationships when it comes to husband and wife? In other words, does the scripture say she who finds a husband finds a good thing or he who, uh, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord? Which one? I believe it says the man that he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Okay, so why is it that you have a lot of women? And we've seen this. Mm -hmm. Go to churches. And the first thing they say is, I'm coming here looking for a husband. No, they don't. They don't say that? I don't know. Do they? Yes, they do. I don't think I, they say I've heard, I've heard a lot of them say it, uh, D. Michelle. Say, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to go to church and look for a husband because, you know, these men out here, they, they this, dead and a third, so I'm going to look for a husband at church. A lot of, I've heard that too many times. 
Well, see, I interviewed over 20 men for my second book, and I heard that they don't say it, but they dress like it. And I heard that when the offering plate is passed, sometimes they put their number on the back of the envelope for the man they see at the end of the aisle who didn't come with somebody. So I don't know if they say it so much as they operate in it, they dress like it, and they're making moves. I had a guy tell me when he's trying to be celibate, notice he said when he's trying to live holy, be celibate, he actually doesn't go to church because the church is the easiest place for him to meet a woman and have sex with. I said, no. what's that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Now do you see now do you see the problem? So the I people that you interviewed, the twenty guys you interviewed probably wasn't around the people I I've been around in my lifetime have heard women say this that yeah. yeah, the place to go look for a man is the church house. So as you can see that it's out of order in the church house of some of the women, correct? That's basically what you just said. Mm hmm So so it and it also is so out of order, and I do news stories on this all the time. It's so out of order that not only do they go after some of the men, why are they going after the preacher? I could not comment on that. I have not interviewed women who are. So once I interview women who have, I, I could be able to be better to answer that. But well, I love, I love that political answer. <laughs> <laughs> you need to run for public office. Well, so political. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could not answer that. I have not interviewed women in that capacity. I do know there are wolves in sheep's clothing. There are shepherds out there that will befriend women, and women will think, oh, he said this is going on in their marriage. And some women, they are, I won't call them thirsty or desperate, but they are starved for, you know, that love, that wholeness connection that they think this godly man is going to do what he says he's going to do. Now, it's out of order. But there's a whole lot of things that are out of order. Yeah, because I've, you know, what you were referring to, like say with the with the, you know, think about how sad it is that what you just told me. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, the depth of this. A yeah. man says that I'm trying to do the right thing when you know women just literally do anything with you just by on compliments nowadays. Right. He's trying to let's say not do that, trying to maybe find a good woman, and yet he got to stay away from the church house. Because if he stay there, he going to have relations with a woman in an area that's supposed. So it goes back to what you said before. The biggest issue that you see, even in the churches, is that the women need to really understand that, you know, it's not a man. It's supposed to be, you know, the Lord. Yeah. And and I think, you know, I can hear the women now saying, but there's a whole bunch of men in the church that's doing wrong, too. And, and they're pretending like they're a minister or this and that and say they're going to pray with me and then tell me if they I have sex, they're going to marry. So I think it's on both sides. I can't just say the women or the men. It's, it's on both sides. I mean, it's to the point where I myself have even spoken out loud like, you know, I'm going to get a man that loves Jesus, but may not have a church home because I don't want the mess. <laughs> you know, I don't want all the other stuff that I hear about. But I believe that God is able, that if people will really fix their eyes on Jesus for real and understand that they're a new creature and understand that they can be whole and complete, that we won't see as much of this. But right now, the media, the entertainment, everything is hyper Everything is sexualized and about relationships. Hmm. That, that's interesting because I thought that, and, and this this is why I have a big problem in a lot of churches today. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people. Just last Saturday, I was at uh, the Black Male Summit, and I had two good people, they say was, the Christians, come up to me and speak to me about uh, the current things going on in the church right now and how they just not liking, you know, a lot of things that's going on in the church. Um and one of the things they kept focusing on was things like that. So why is it that the right teaching isn't going across so we all could, you know, do the right thing? Because a lot of stuff that we see going on is not what the Lord won't. Yeah, and, and I don't want to put my mouth on, you know, any certain particular. No, no, we're not. We're not speaking on nobody <laughs> in particular. We're just talking about things that just a general. Yeah, but what, but what I think is, to your point, we've kind of lost the way. What was the way? Jesus was the way, mm -hmm. but we've lost that way. Everything has become about what is going to entertain me. People are just like you said in a relationship. We're supposed to go to the table ready to see what we can give, not what we can get. Mm -hmm. Same thing at the church. People aren't coming to church thinking about what can I give to the church. They thinking about what they can get from the church. 
and that's everybody top down from the congregation pews um, to the from the church goers to the Christ goers. Everybody's looking for what they can get and being more looking on the outside versus on the inside. So I think you have the same thing that's happening in relationships is happening in the body. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you study the life of Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't, didn't uh, be in the temple uh, all the time. He wasn't in there trying to uh, beat somebody over head about Malachi chapter three under a total different dispensation. I don't know why they do that. Uh, Jesus was outside of the people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if and if the, if you go back just to the original way the church started, which is out with the people. Right. And, and, and that's that's where you have a lot of younger people. And I talk to them all the time. Why they have an issue with churches is because they don't see them out. Right. And like you said, entertainment's going on, and that has a lot to do with leadership as well. It's not just the people, because if, if you say you have a decent, and not all people do this, but you have a decent past to get up and say, you know what, we're going out today. Um, there's an issue with a certain case, um, un unjust case of police brutality or whatever. Let's say that. Okay. And, you know, you being a pastor, you get more respect when you step out there uh, versus, let's say, a young activist who's just full of zeal and, 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 but they just want to do the right thing. You know, we see, you know, some pastors that's very well off and have thousands of followers. And, and the thing is we have to see more of the, the church out in the, in the streets with the people, mm -hmm. you know, uh, when you have something like Ferguson, you have something like Trayvon Martin, where are the preachers? Yeah. And, and I believe they're there. I mean, I got to give that shout out to Chicago and Salem Baptist Church of Chicago, Reverend James T. Meeks. When I was there, I just look, we are all, we were always out. I love that every summer you knew there was a thing. We were going to adopt every corner to pray on. We were going to go to the taste and pray and witness. I remember one year we had a goal of let's win 20,000 souls to Christ and everybody, the entire body was focused on, have we invited people to Christ? Have we tried to pray with people? And it wasn't just invite people to church. It was really going out into the community. Um, there are other churches as well that I've been involved with that were really focused on going out. Even now I've caught myself when I look at myself, when I was a new believer, it was about going into the church. I was running into a building a lot, but I believe that that disciplined me to some degree. But now I freely admit any church I go to, I tell the pastor, I travel a lot. I do this and that. I love Jesus. You probably won't see me that much. And uh, you know, I'll be here when I'm here. But know that I'm on mission. I'm out doing what God's called me to do. Now, you say you, you travel a lot. Uh, you're a motivational speaker. Uh, what's one of the main topics that people invite you to speak on? Really, it's the one we talked about earlier, the baggage, the soul ties. I'm invited a lot to talk about cutting the substitutes. How do I get to that? It's almost deliverance to a degree, but I introduce people. How am I going to be free from all this stuff that I have on me that's holding me back so that I can be available? A lot of times I tell people single doesn't equal available. And so you have to understand, am I really available to be found? You know, a lot of women want to be found, but are you available to be found? I had to take my own juice and realize I'm not really available. I got 10 million things, so do I really want it? I have to be honest with myself. There's some things in life that have to be in order for me to be available. And so I think you have to check yourself and understand that. So I teach on that a lot. Yeah, because I tell you know, and I tell men the same thing, which you just said. Um, and say I don't think some men are ready either. Um, if you, the fiance, you don't have uh, your things in order, like having your own place, having your own car, uh, just having your mentality together that you can actually handle a relationship and be mature. Um, then you, yeah, like I say, you could be single, but you're not ready because sometimes, like I say, but if a man get with a woman, got things going on like you. But he don't have a car. He said, "Can you come pick me up?" Like, dude, really? Uh uh. <laughs> you know. Uh, so, no. and that amazes me by some men. It's not just the women; it's the men too. Some of these men are are, are really, you know, uh, some of them live in the house of their mom or some of them. It, like, look, take care of your situation with the man you first. Love you though. You live in your house, your mom. You getting it together. We just, you know. Uh huh. That's where you at right now. You know. But, but you're not ready. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so it, it definitely goes both ways, you know, and, and I'm a little hard on guys a lot more than I am on women when it comes to trying to get themselves, you know, ready. Um, but you're saying about finding stuff to getting rid of things. What is the next thing that you discuss with them? Really, I talk a lot about setting. I always call it um, delight yourself in the Lord and you receive the desires of your heart. 
And I talk about how don't be surprised when you really focus on God. The desires may not be the husband as much as it is figuring out what my purpose is. As you get closer to him, your desire may not be, for example, for me as a child, I always dreamed of traveling the world, doing mission work. And now I can't be shocked when I get these opportunities. That dream and that that was a desire of God. And so that's almost greater than anything else for me. So when you was a child, were you always a natural speaker? Um, I used to teach Sunday school to my teddy bears and my baby dolls in my daddy's office. So, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, because, because when people don't like uh, the reason why I ask that question is because, you know, every one of us have gifts. And a lot of times we don't even pay attention to what they are. A lot of times we do things naturally. It's so easy for us to do. And usually if you follow the gifts that you already have in you. You can actually turn it in, into something great. But sometimes, you know, when you make the wrong decision. You pervert those gifts. You know, that happens as well. And it also leads you down the wrong path. Um, so, you know, yeah, pay attention to your gifts. That's why I tell everybody, like, you know, me, I've always spoke all the time with people, give advice to people. It's for some reason, it, it sounds good to them if they, it works. So, um, you know, I, I focus on a lot of my gifts as well. Um, outside, what's the next thing that you teach them outside of that? Um, I really teach, I start going into more about the heart matters. Uh, again, I, I go back to cut the substitutes a lot. I feel like every road we end up going back there. But we talk about the wholeness. We talk about cutting the substitutes. We talk about, um, or I talk about with them, about how can I really have more of a relationship with Christ and go from religion to relationship. Because I think a lot of times people fill up their time doing activities, but they don't even know why they're doing it. And so I really talk about that private time with the Lord, how important it is to set your table for one, pray in the morning. I talk about fasting. I talk about having accountability partners because I say it's no good to clean your house and get fresh and renew and then go back to everything and everybody you used to be with. Mm -hmm. If you are going to be this new creature in Christ, if you do want to be free from all the old soul ties or baggage and emotional wounds, who do I have around that are like my accountability partners? Yes, I have God. Yes, I can pray. But who, who's my accountability? And so I have some strong people in my life that will correct me and check me. <laughs> Thank you, Nan. <laughs> At any moment when they see I'm getting kind of skewed or um, going back to, they call me the old me, you know, versus mm -hmm. are you D. Michelle right now? Or are you acting like Darius, you know, the old you or whatever, my first thing. So. You gotta have accountability. Yeah, you know what you said earlier. I think is the biggest problem with people um, when you say religion versus relationship yeah. when it comes to you know uh, the law, because it's better to have a relationship because a relationship is a daily thing. A religion is a once a week thing. Pray this way, sing this way. It goes back to the entertainment we was talking about. It goes back to uh, doing things that you know that's not right because you have religion. Because you have a relationship with the Lord, you can't do that stuff because you're like, you know, wait a minute, this is not right. This could hurt my actual relationship. I could grieve, you know, God on the things that I'm doing that's not right. And, and you know, I think that needs to be preached a lot more than anything. People think just going to a church building, you got it. You know, and that's why you have people doing the things they're doing in these churches. Yeah. So they don't have that relationship. Yeah. And, and I think like what you mentioned, everything that's going on in the church right now, in different church houses, when you have relationship, you won't be moved. You know, the Bible talks about in the last days, will you be able to stand? And so a part of standing is having that relationship, because when you don't have a relationship, when the pastor cheats on somebody, you stop going to church. When Sister Fluffy Head ends up telling you X, Y, Z, then you end up saying, I can't stand church women or whatever. So we start developing these what we call narratives or thoughts about the church that are negative based on these experiences. And then we don't have a we don't we stop praying. We stop doing this because we say that's all about church and religion. And so when you have that relationship, you're not moved. Things can happen and you're sitting there like, OK, yeah, that's. This is me and Jesus. That have nothing to do with me and Jesus. <laughs> yep, mm -hmm. that happened. Did you know so and so? Oh, really? That's them. I'm with Jesus. So you're saying that, uh, you know, before we uh, wrap this up, when when people hear 
uh, you say that, and you, you know, you, because you openly admitted this. I mean, I don't. I you shocked me when you told me you was forty three, but when you, people tell you that, hey, okay, you're single, you forty three. What gives you the expertise to teach on this subject because you're not married? Well, see, I think it's the flip because I am. It gives me the expertise because I can sit here and say, thank God I ain't got to worry about an STD report coming back. Mm -hmm. Thank God, you know, I get a call tomorrow that says you need to be in Dubai next week. I'm going to Dubai next week without a thought of who I need to call to watch the kids. And da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Thank God that, you know what, I don't have a divorce that I'm trying to heal from. Thank God. I, I, I operate from a different standpoint that, wow, there's been many married people who've come up to me after a workshop and whispered, where were you when I was single? Why didn't anyone tell me this? I've had to learn everything you taught on this side of marriage. And this is hard. Because now I'm in this and I'm in Christ and I'm trying to make this work. So I believe I have the reverse testimony of what God has, what I call the grace of God. That, hey, because of the grace, because I knew this, because God taught me this, I didn't have to go through those things that other women are going through and other men have gone through. That is by his grace. Now, do you feel you're called to be single? I, like, like Paul was single? Mm-hmm. I always tell people, funny, you want to know why I'm still single? Because Paul wasn't born at this time, so we would have been together, you know. But no, actually, I heard Paul may have been married at one point. But anyway, that's a study for another day. Mm -hmm. Anywho, um, I believe in this season I'm called to be single on this day, whatever day and time this in. But I believe God can call me into marriage tomorrow. But, you know, I'm whole and complete. I have to operate in where I am in this day. Okay, so I guess to any brother that uh, heard that, you know, if you run into her, she say she open. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> you just turned it off, right? Yeah. Well, hey, you know, you you know how it is. We, we definitely gotta let let the audience know because sometimes they get messages and say, "Hey, I heard this sister say that, so I'm a good Christian man." So you know, where was she at? So I want to make sure we put that out there. And I'd be like, go to tablesone.org and download the resume profile and fill that out. And then my prayer partners will be praying over it and anointing it. And then they'll get back to me to get back to you in another 45 days. Oh, Lord, demon shit. <laughs> sit up now. I ain't do it. ain't going to go through all that. <laughs> hey, <laughs> he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord, right? You're, you're right about that. Look, the, favor, the favor. The favor. You're right. You're right. Look. <laughs> The favor I got from my husband, he gonna come for it. The Trust favor you got, I thought you were supposed to be obtaining it from the Lord, not from you. Well, the favor he gonna get from us coming together, he <laughs> gonna want this. He gonna he he gonna go through the forty five day whatever. Oh Lord! Now you said forty-five days. You know what? Let, let me not even go there. That, that's gonna, that's gonna, that's gonna turn the interview to a totally different area. So so, D. Michelle, where people can pick up your book? Uh, they can go to Amazon.com and get Table for One, please, or Table for One. Thanks. Table for One, please, gives the female side of the journey. Table for One, thanks, gives the male side. And you can go to TableforOne.org, and that's Table F O R Number One dot org. Um, you have any current speaking engagements that maybe someone can attend in um, different cities coming up? Um, I know I'll be in the Houston area later in October this year for a workshop with the National Black Book Festival. So I'll be in Houston for that. And then I believe I have some coming up this spring back in the Midwest. So go to tableforone.org and you can keep posted on the upcoming events. All right. Well, I want to definitely thank D. Michelle for coming on the show today. We uh, had a good discussion about singleness and people being whole and uh, Lord. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. You know, relationship versus religion. Um, you know, and if any of the Christian brothers want to talk to her, you got to go through a, a rigmarole process. But I guess if it's worth it, she'll give you favor. So um, definitely thank you for joining the program. Amen. Thank you.